Uh, all right, now, third up is an interesting, interesting title for a person. Sherry Kafka Wagner is an enigma. Grew up in Arkansas, interested in stories and in other places, so made her way to Baylor, where the extraordinary Paul Baker taught her that developing an understanding of the creative process meant you could work on any project. And then, after that, she has spent the last 50 years or so working on projects in everything from writing to urban planning, museum consulting, TV and film, and in many different captivating places as well. Please give it up for the enigma, Sherry Kafka Wagner. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. First, I want to give a shout out to Vicki Young. I wouldn't be doing this if it were not for her powers of persuasion, and I couldn't be doing it if it was not for her enormous help and skills. So, thank you, Vicki. What I want to do tonight is to talk about the role that words have played in my life. So, here we go. My earliest memory, I'm three years old on the porch in Arkansas saying, Flatfoot flew you with the floy floy, delighted by the sound and rhythm of the words over and over. Flatfoot flew you with the floy floy. Then I found words could come together to make a story when I was four, and I got this book, Black Beauty. Now, I also found that if you printed words on paper, you could hear the story over and over, as long as you could coerce your family into reading it to you. And so finally, they decided to put me in front of the radio, where I could listen to Lux Radio Theater and all the other shows. And those stories could fill your mind with images, with suspense. They could make you laugh. They could make you cry. They could terrify you. I was caught in the power of the narrative. Now, hallelujah, at six I learned to read. And as I read about Dick and Jane, who lived where there was enough snow for sledding, and their farms had painted houses and big silos, those places were not like Arkansas. I found that reading could take me to new places and show me new people. So, when I was seven, I spent every Saturday at the movies. And now stories had words and music and images. I saw Meryl Oberon as George Sand. She wrote books, lived in Paris, and looked great in men's clothes. No princesses for me. I had George Son. So at 11, I found a volume of Greek myths in the school library. Together with Bible stories, I began to see that there could be deeper meanings to stories, ethical questions and dilemmas, like, do you sacrifice your young daughter for winds so your ships can sail to make war in Troy? Oh, that's a good one. In the ninth grade, my teacher played a recording of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar to my utter delight. Some words were just too good to let go of. So I began keeping a notebook where I wrote words that I liked and, and sentences that struck me and poems that moved me. At 15, for the first time, I read a book portraying places and people like the ones I knew. Until now, all the writing had seemed to come from faraway places, from Boston and Paris and London and New York. But William Faulkner wrote about my part of the country, his characters speaking with voices I recognized. So at 17, desperately looking for a way to go to college, I won an essay writing contest, which gave the winner a year at school. Now, yes, in 1954, $1,000 could do that. Yeah, the assigned subject, what I would tell an immigrant about America. Some irony there, right? Okay, but Baylor, where I went, I found the wonderful luck of Paul Baker. He said, you want to be a writer? And I said, no, sir, wanting has nothing to do with it. That's just what I am. And Baker said, all minds are creative, each in its own way. You have to learn how your mind works. So at Berla Baker, I saw words become action in my first play, A Cloud of Witnesses, written by a San Antonio playwright about the Alamo. Baker told us, 
A stage is an empty space. The writers, actors, designers, directors shape that space into meaningful images. He used theater productions like this one to teach us the elements that make up all created forms. Light, which reveals color and texture. Rhythm, the basis for sound and movement. And space, cut by line to make shape. Taking part in plays allowed Baker students to explore both individual and collaborative creativity and how those two work together. We experienced how writing fused with designing, directing, acting, producing, managing, and audience receptivity to make a production. So I left Baylor and went to the writer's workshop at the University of Iowa, where I continued writing the novel I'd yeah. <laughs> So I continued writing the novel I'd started in Waco, and I wrote a play. The novel was published, the play appears in the collection. I wrote some children's books, and then my life took a big turn. I got a job in San Antonio working on developing a World's Fair, where projects began with words but ended in exhibits and buildings and urban projects, as well as films, television shows, and magazine stories, my view of collaborative creativity greatly expanded. I became fascinated with how narratives underline even complicated long-term projects like the San Antonio River or the Market District. I began listening for stories for how people's lived experience yields ideas necessary to shape sustainable projects. For example, the successful revitalization efforts of Chattanooga began with the first step, creating a unique freshwater Tennessee aquarium to tell the story of how water moves from the Smoky Mountains through the Tennessee River to the Gulf of Mexico. When working on projects in many places and several countries, like this project in Kuwait, I learned each place had a unique story based on its history and culture, something only that place could tell. Here at the New Scientific Center, we included a dock with historic Kuwaiti boats that had sailed for thousands of years. My father told me, writing can be a profession, but it is always a skill. For more than 50 years, I've had the privilege of collaborating with others, including children, to move from words to realize projects for cities, parks, museums, magazines, television, multimedia, and film. Preparing this program, I discovered that Slim Gayard, seen here, wrote Flatfoot Fluji about an awkward, flat-footed prostitute, the Fluji, <laughs> with venereal disease, the Floyd Floyd. <laughs> so you see, Words have dimensions beyond their meaning. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Wow. Um, so the uh, first question right off is uh, Fluji. Um, <laughs> is that? Is that a floozy with a venereal disease, or what, what does that mean exactly? What? Well, evidently, Slim Gayard liked to make up words, and he uh, uh, decided that, but evidently, floozy was something that they used for a prostitute. Now, I found this wait, out wait, wait. only working on this program, because what I was listening <laughs> right. to was Satchmo and the Mills Brothers singing it. Uh -huh. so, so that was, it's floozy though, right? Floozy, flat foot floozy with the fly, fly. Okay, and how did you get to, you, know, you said you came to San Antonio mm -hmm. um, for a project, exactly what that was, and then how did Hemisphere. you? Hemisphere. But what did you do at Hemisphere, exactly? Well, um, I did a lot of things. I wrote a lot of material for um, exhibits. Mm -hmm. I uh, wrote a lot of material for the publications. I, uh, I started, I wrote all the material and developed the Women's Pavilion. I, uh, oh. yes! <laughs> And I developed uh, Project Y for the kids, and I also worked uh, with Mr. Gerard writing for the Magic of a People, the folk art exhibit that he did. Oh, okay. And have you seen, there's an institute, I'm going to do a little ad here. At, over at the Institute of Texan and Cultures right now, there's a Hemisphere exhibit. Have you been yes. over there? You've been over there, yes, right? Yes, I have. When they opened that. Are, is any of your work in there? Were you wearing the, the little outfits that... Uh... <laughs> no, but you know, I uh, actually designed one of the outfits, the ones for the boat ride. I uh, actually designed them. I didn't really design them. I just went to 
to Sears and picked out all the parts. Ah, <laughs> nice. I worked at Sears, so I may have sold you that. Um, well, now, and what are you doing these days? Oh, what I'm doing these days? Well, I've been working with Pearl on our big Olay project this summer. Mm -hmm. We, yes. We made cabezutos and gigantes, and the children made masks, and we've done a lot of, brought a lot of people. It's been an intercambio and exchange. So we bring artists, as we brought the maestro from Catalonia and his wife, and they worked with all the people at Southwest School to make these wonderful things. And we brought dancers and singers, and I've been working on that. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm also working in Montreal on a new project there that has a lot of parts to it, but the one I'm really excited about is an Arctic ecotarium. It'll tell uh, the story of the Arctic. I'm sorry, the Ar an Arctic, Arctic ecotarium. ecotarium. Yep, we're gonna tell the whole eco story, not just the water, but we wanna tell about the land and the people and wow. all the things that are happening in the Arctic. And do you have your movie, <laughs> ask her about your movie. <laughs> oh, Vicki. <laughs> I, I, you know, Wait, well, now which movie are we talking about? Is it the flat-footed... Uh... Flew with Floyd, uh, Floyd. Um, I will be on 9-11. I will celebrate my 82nd birthday. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So I think that in my eighth decade, I needed a first. And so recently I did my first thing. I acted in a movie doing a monologue from one of Hart and Foote's plays in a documentary called The Man from Morton. It was my first time to act in a movie. Wow. <laughs> so, and when is that? When can we see that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It might, I might be left on the cutting room floor. If they're smart, they probably will do that. <laughs> but do you know when that's coming out? You don't know no, it no, at all? No, no. They're still working it, on it. It's coming they out have on. a rough cut. That's all I know. So some guy just said, hey, come here, baby. We're going to well, shoot a little movie with you. And They made me audition and everything. Really? But yeah, so um, I've never done it. So it was fun. Well, and are you still writing in terms of books, things like that? Would you like you to? You know, I... I uh, still do write some for myself. I uh, write short stories. I've got a box that I put them in, and I do write from time to time. I do a lot of writing with my work. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now I'm writing a thing about uh, the Inuit community and the climate change and what it's doing to the people in the Arctic. And that is uh, wow. fun to write. All right, well, uh, we're about out of time, but one last question I have to ask you. And I'm sure everybody here is, what keeps you so young? You're not 82. You're lying. <laughs> You're like 18, like she is. Well, you know, my great-grandmother came in a covered wagon to Arkansas and homesteaded, and she took her four months, and, and she had uh, eight children, and she found out that she was pregnant along the way. And one of the things she said to me, they never show on TV a woman having morning sickness on a wagon train. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> So she lived to be 98 and died working, and I intend to follow in her shoes. Wow. Well, thank you very much.